Thus says the Lord to the Anointed One, I will give you as a light to the nations, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Lord, open our lips. And our mouth shall proclaim. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness, and come before his presence with a song. Know this, the Lord himself is God. He himself has made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and call upon his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his faithfulness endures from age to age. Hallelujah! How good it is to sing praises to our God! How pleasant it is to honor him with praise! The Lord rebuilds Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He counts the number of the stars and calls them all by their names. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. There is no limit to his wisdom. The Lord lifts up the lowly, but casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make music to our God upon the harp. He covers the heavens with clouds and prepares rain for the earth. He makes grass to grow upon the mountains and green plants to serve mankind. He provides food for flocks and herds and for the young ravens when they cry. He is not impressed by the might of a horse. He has no pleasure in the strength of a man. But the Lord has pleasure in those who fear him, in those who await his gracious favor. Hallelujah. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to live in, who brings princes to naught and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth. When he blows upon them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble, 
To whom they will you compare me? To whom is my equal? Says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host and numbers them, calling them all by name. Because he is great in strength, mighty in power. Not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of this earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
A reading from the Gospel according to Mark. When Jesus and his disciples left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God.
Let us together affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let them be seen with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. For only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care. And guide us in ways of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth. Your saving help among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and sustain us, your Holy Spirit. Set us free, O God, from the bondage of our sins, and give us the liberty of that abundant life which you have made known to us in your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O God, you make us glad with the weekly remembrance of the glorious resurrection of your Son, our Lord. Give us this week, this day, such blessing through our worship of you, that the week to come may be spent in your favor, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose Spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, Receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So what comes to mind when you hear these words? Colony, colonial, colonist, colonization. Words like these have become very charged terms, haven't they? To put it bluntly, these words have become attached to the image of Europeans bringing into places such as Africa, South Asia, and the Americas, and forcibly, perhaps even violently, 
imposing their ways, their customs, and their religion upon the natives. Now, this characterization is not entirely unfair. What I just described is indeed a part of world history. It is hardly, however, the only time in world history that such behavior has occurred. It is, in fact, a repetitive pattern in human affairs that one people group oversteps its bounds and imposes itself upon another, bringing its ways, its religion, and its culture to a land already occupied by another civilization. And if we're completely honest, the biblical book of Joshua is actually a story of colonization. With God's full-throated sanction, the Israelites enter into the already populated land of Canaan and proceed to conquer and decimate the civilizations living there as they take the land for their own. But in spite of its presence in the Bible and its presence throughout the pages of human history, the act and the mindset of colonization is something we need to question very deeply. In this month where we are encouraged to pay special attention to the history and the heritage of the African diaspora, I would suggest it's an excellent time to have a critical look at this. I would even go so far as to say that the colonizer thinking is almost exclusively responsible for the tension that exists today between nations and races. Given the fact that human migration is at an all-time high, there has never been a better time to critically examine and seek to deconstruct the mindset of colonization. Now, I know that this is, as I said at the beginning of this message, a charged topic. But if we can shelve our emotional reactions for a moment, I believe that there's a very simple and practical case that can be made for the work I'm suggesting we do. The case is this. None of us wants to live in a war zone. The past several years have seen significant flare-ups in violence between races and cultures in many areas around the globe, including our own land. And if we don't figure out new and better ways of living together, this phenomenon is only going to grow. With the unprecedented fluidity of the human population, It is simply no longer possible to organize ourselves into clearly identified tribes with clear lines of demarcation between them. A single ride on the London Underground today will tell you, for example, that there is no longer a simple, clear answer to the question of who and what a Londoner is. And even if we wanted to again organize ourselves into clearly defined tribes, it's simply not possible. We share the same systems of government, the same roads, the same schools, the same public buildings and institutions, and the same water supply with people and people groups who are palpably different from us. If we want to live in peace, we must learn how to live well with this reality. 
We must figure out what to do, how to do, what I am going to call decolonizing our thinking. Now, what, you might ask, does this have to do with our Christian faith and tradition? Much more than meets the eye. As I said a moment ago, the book of Joshua chronicles a period of conquest and colonization. But immediately following that book is a series of other stories that give the whole history a meaning quite different from what first meets the eye. The book of Judges, the one that immediately follows Joshua, describes Israel's earliest years settled in the land of Canaan. At that time, it was a loose tribal confederacy, which unlike every other surrounding nation, had no earthly king. God alone was their king. Only in times of severe trouble did a unifying human leader, a so-called judge, arise to guide them through the tumult. And once that work was done, the judge would retire, and Israel would return to its non-monarchial ways. And let us not forget that even though the Bible makes much of Kings David and Solomon, it was not God who ultimately sought to make Israel a monarchy. In the time of the prophet Samuel, the people clamored for a king, and God grudgingly gave approval, warning the people through Samuel that this was not a good idea at all. Likewise, a temple with permanent foundations wasn't God's idea at all. God was perfectly happy to dwell with the people in a portable tabernacle. It was David and then ultimately Solomon who insisted upon an earthly building with stable foundations. So I'll be honest, I definitely struggle with the Bible's depiction of the conquest of the land of Canaan. I don't feel like it adequately answers the question of how God could sanction such a thing. This was an act of violent colonization if ever there was one. But when I look at the way of life that God intended for the Israelite people in the land of Canaan, it makes at least a bit more sense. Israel was meant to be a nation utterly unique among all the peoples of the earth. No king, no palace, and a mobile tabernacle as its temple. The Israelites were meant to be a people who had a very unique relationship with the land. They were meant to understand themselves as the stewards of the land, but to be utterly clear that God, and not they, was the owner of the land. Now this is perhaps the mindset that when we manage to truly cultivate it is the antidote to the colonial mindset. And it's not an easy one to cultivate. We human beings seem to be always seeking a permanent place to drop anchor. We want a home that we own and where we will not have to pick up and leave for the foreseeable future. I'm right there myself. We do not want to feel like guests everywhere we go. 
But guests everywhere we go is actually the state, spiritually speaking, that God encourages us to maintain throughout the pages of Scripture. We certainly see it in today's gospel. Jesus is itinerant for his entire adult ministry. He actively resists any attempts on the part of his disciples or the surrounding Judean society to establish any kind of geographic base of power for his ministry. And it's not just the Gospels. The writer of the letter to the Hebrews extols those heroes of faith who acted like strangers and sojourners, always in search of an abiding city that nothing on this earth can provide. It's a tough posture to maintain. In spite of intense temptation to seek things that are stable and permanent, we need to really limit talking and thinking in terms of ownership. Phrases like, my house, our land, our church, while very comforting, have little backing in Scripture. We are stewards of all of these things, but owners of none. But if we can achieve this difficult state of mind and heart, the reward is so great. The peace and reconciliation that we seek may actually come within reach. If we are stewards of everything and owners of nothing, guests everywhere we go, then we cannot be colonists. And for that matter, we cannot be colonized. Sure, we can travel the earth and engage with its other residents, but we do so with the clear understanding that it is God and not we who is the owner of everywhere our feet tread. There is in this state no motivation to conquer and no threat of conquest. Perhaps all of this boils down to a simple adage. It's often been said that the work of the Christian is to follow Jesus and not merely to admire him. Jesus, as he is presented in today's gospel and in all of the gospels, is a figure remarkably unconcerned with establishing ownership of anything in an earthly sense. He wanders from place to place and rebukes attempts to give him any sort of permanent wealth or status on the earth. He is the antithesis of a colonist. And if we want to be his followers, women and men who take on the mind of Christ, he calls us, as hard as it may be, to be likewise. With boundless joy in Christ's epiphany to all peoples, let us pray, saying, O Christ of all nations, hear our prayer. O God, who made blessed Son, your blessed Son manifest to all the peoples of the world, and bid him to preach peace to all those far off and those near. You call your people to unite in worship, 
that we might receive power to become your children, divine beings in whom your word has hands and feet. Pour out your blessing upon the church throughout the world that gathers for this purpose. Send this blessing especially today upon the Anglican Communion, including Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, and the Anglican Church of Burundi. Pour out your spirit also upon the Episcopal Church and our diocese, including Michael, our presiding bishop, Mark, our bishop, and St. Timothy's Church in Danville. Let your blessing also come on to our fellow faith assemblies, especially St. Matthew, St. Michael's Catholic Church in Livermore. O Christ of all nations, hear our prayer. O God, in whom mercy and justice embrace, we ask for your love to take wings in all the nations and the peoples of the world. Bend the hearts of all nations and peoples towards peace and righteousness. Send your spirit especially upon Joe, our president, Gavin, our governor, Bob, our mayor, and all who serve in legislative assemblies or judicial roles in this and every land. O Christ of all nations, hear our prayer. O God of perfect health and wholeness in this time of pandemic and the fear and uncertainty that surround it, we lift up to you those who care for the sick and the suffering pour out a special blessing upon all who follow your call to care for others in body, mind, or spirit, especially all nurses, doctors, police, and firefighters, and especially Brad O and Brad S. Give them the gifts of courage and joy in their work and protect them from all adversity and harm. O Christ of all nations, hear our prayer. O Word made flesh, this congregation gathers as a people inspired by your first coming and looking for your coming again. Bless all its members with the gifts of hope, wisdom, and compassion. We lift up to you especially these members in our weekly cycle of prayer. We pray for Cherry, James, Mark, Abigail, Jessica, Charlotte, and Patrick. And we also commend to your grace and protection those in military service. For Aaron, Joey, Abigail, Valerie, Amber, Christopher, and Taylor. O Christ of all nations, hear our prayer. We pray also for all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, especially those who have requested our prayers for healing and wholeness. We pray for Olivia, Becky, Carol, Carl, Carol, Kathy, Chilopi M, Dave, David, Aaron, Esteban, Miroslava, and Tamra, for Glennis, for Geraldine, Umberto, Candida, and family, for Janice, Jim, and Janet, for Josh, for Lisa B, for Luke, for Marge and family, for Marie R, for Mary L, for Marissa and family, for Monty and Judy, for Nick, for Olga, for Michael, Sandra, and Henrietta, for Sarah, for Michael E, for Sylvia P, for Steve W and children, for Tamara S, for the Herman family, the Purcell family, the Moon family, the Ruzika family, the Boer family, and the Montgomery family. And we also want healing prayers for all of God's creatures experiencing chaos 
and especially all those suffering from the effects of COVID. May you all feel God's love for you. Give to your people the gifts of comfort and healing, as well as a lively and abiding faith in your goodness throughout all circumstances. O Christ of all nations, hear our prayer. Lord Christ, in your passion and resurrection, you made death the gateway to new and eternal life. Pour that life upon all your servants departed this life. We pray for Sharon H., for Linda G., for John M., for Marie R., for Vern P., for Joan B., and for Elda M., and raise them to everlasting glory in your kingdom. O Christ of all nations, hear our prayer. And now, O Christ, in eager anticipation of your coming kingdom, we pray to you with hearts and voices for our other needs and concerns. We offer you thanks for all the blessings of this life. Let us gather the prayers of our hearts into one in the words attributed to St. John Chrysostom. Almighty God, you you have have given given us grace at this time time, with with one accord accord, to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions, as may be best for us. Grant us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Amen.
Let us bless the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.